Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The second major English settlement in New England, following Plymouth Colony, was the Massachusetts Bay Colony. John Winthrop was an English Puritan lawyer and one of the leading figures in founding the colony. He led the first large wave of colonists across the Atlantic Ocean from England in 1630. Reacting to the repressive religious policies of England, over the next ten years, about 20,000 Puritans emigrated from England to Massachusetts and the neighboring colonies during what came to be known as the Great Migration or the Puritan Migration to New England. Pastor Lance Rolston of the History of the Christian Church podcast has graciously agreed to share with us his unique views on this remarkable period in history. Postmodern view of the Western Hemisphere and the New World tends to reduce all European missionaries to a monochromatic Eurocentrism that leveled Native American cultures. That simply wasn't the case. Yes, there were plenty of Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestants who conflated the gospel with their mother culture, but there were not a few missionaries who understood the different and valued the uniqueness that was Native American cultures. They sought to incarnate the Christian message in those cultures and languages. That often got them into trouble with officials back home who wanted to exploit indigenous peoples. In other words, it isn't just modern liberation theology advocates that sought to protect the people of the New World from the exploitive injustices of the old. Many early missionaries did as well. Protestants were a bit late to the game. North America presented a very different scene for missions than Central and South America. The voyage of the Mayflower with its pilgrims in 1620 was a historical pointer to the strong influence of Calvinism in what would become New England. The states of Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire were strongly Congregationalist or Presbyterian in terms of church polity and heavily influenced by English Puritanism. At least some of these pioneers felt a responsibility for spreading the Christian faith to Native Americans. Besides Presbyterians and Congregationalists, Episcopalians achieved some success in evangelizing the Indians. While it's fashionable in some circles today to eschew the use of the label Indian in favor of the assumed moniker Native American for indigenous peoples of the New World, many of their modern-day descendants have made clear their desire to be called Indians or to refer to their tribal identity rather than Native American. Puritanism in the New World During the reign of James I, some Puritans grew discouraged at the pace of reform in England and separated entirely from the Church of England. After a sojourn of about 11 years in the Netherlands, a group of these separating Puritans, known to us as the Pilgrims, set sail for the New World. The Dutch were generally welcoming of these English dissenters because they shared the same faith and, as the English were such hard workers, added to their booming economy. But the English grew distressed after a little more than a decade that their children were becoming more Dutch than English. They couldn't return to England, where tension was thick between the Crown and the Puritans, and so they decided to set sail for the New World and try their fortune there. They established a colony at Plymouth in 1620 in what is now southeastern Massachusetts. While it struggled greatly at first, it eventually succeeded and became something of a model for other English settlements in the region. Back in England, when Archbishop Laud suppressed Puritans, immigration to the New World increased. As the Puritans' relationship with the king soured, a Puritan lawyer named John Winthrop began plans for a colony in New England. In March of 1629, Winthrop obtained a royal charter to establish the Massachusetts Bay Colony. A year later, he was joined by 700 colonists on 11 ships and set sail. While aboard the Arbella, Winthrop preached a sermon declaring to his fellow travelers, quote, We shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, unquote. Others were soon captivated by this vision of a Christian commonwealth, and from 1630 to the beginning of the English Civil War, well over 20,000 Puritans settled in New England. The Great Migration had begun. These later Puritans were different from the separatist pilgrims of Plymouth. They regarded themselves as loyal members of the Church of England, now established in New England. They had the chance to install the reforms that they'd ached to achieve back in England. They may have separated geographically, but not in loyalty to the Church of England. The New England Puritans held a vision, not just of a pure church, but of a purified society. One committed to biblical principles, not just in church affairs, but in all facets of public life. 
the idea of covenant between God and his people was at the center of their enterprise. Following the pattern of God's covenant with Israel, they promised to obey God and in turn he would bless them. This is why one often encounters the terminology that Massachusetts was a kind of new Israel. That required a strict observance of Sabbath. Families were structured as little churches, with the Father bestowing blessings for obedience and, of course, vice versa. This social structure required public piety. It prohibited what were called secular entertainments, like games of chance, dancing around maypoles, horse racing, bear baiting, and the theater. Christmas celebrations were regarded as pagan rituals. Puritans adopted a rich view of piety that at times became excessive and odd. Following the Pietist tradition, New England Puritans required a genuine public declaration of conversion as a condition for church membership. And so problems arose when children, who'd grown up in pious homes and had always counted themselves as born again, when it required them to give testimony to their dramatic conversion event. That led to many of them being excluded from membership in church, which was at the heart and center of social life in New England. Divisions erupted, leading Puritan minister Richard Mather to develop the so-called halfway covenant to solve the problem. The halfway covenant gave a kind of quasi-membership, which included baptism but not communion, to the children of church members. Puritan leaders hoped that this would expose halfway members to an example that would see them have their own born-again experience and usher them into full membership. Some historians assert the pilgrims aimed for a theocracy. While Winthrop was governor, he certainly wanted to base the colony's laws on biblical principles, but he didn't permit clergy in civil governing. Church officials had no authority over civil magistrates. Winthrop and government officials sought the advice of ministers, but political authority rested in the hands of the laity. Theocratic tendencies certainly existed, but the colony's congregationalism restrained them. New England never had enough unity to be a theocracy. While a minority in Old England, Puritans were a majority in New England. A less careful recounting of American history would say that they fled the old world for the new to obtain religious liberty. Not really. They left so they could establish a Puritan system of church and state. There was no religious liberty as we'd conceive it today. Puritan New England was quite intolerant of dissenters, people like Roger Williams and Anne Hutchison. Historian Ed Morgan describes Roger Williams as a, quote, charming, sweet-tempered, winning man, courageous, selfless, God-intoxicated, and stubborn, unquote. Arriving in Boston just a year after Winthrop, he was quickly asked to be pastor of the local congregation, but Williams refused. He was a staunch separatist who vehemently disagreed with the Puritan connection to the Church of England. It stunned his neighbors that a man would turn down the invitation to be a pastor. This and other behaviors so infuriated the leaders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they expelled him. Williams later settled at the tip of the Narragansett Bay on land that had been purchased from the Indians. He named the settlement Providence and declared religious freedom, the first colony in the history of the world in which religious liberty for all was genuine. Infant baptism was banned since Williams believed that baptism was for those that were old enough to make a real profession of faith. He established the first Baptist church in America in 1638. The Hutchesons, William and Anne, arrived in Massachusetts in 1634. They'd followed their minister, John Cotton, pastor of a Boston congregation. Like many Puritans, the Hutchesons hosted a group in their home to discuss Pastor Cotton's sermon from the previous week. Anne excelled at breaking down the message into topics that were engaging. The group grew to upwards of 80 adults. And then, controversy arose when Anne began to argue that all people are under either a covenant of works or grace. She was reacting against the public piety of the people of Boston who assumed that good works proved the presence of salvation. She posited that works and grace were opposites and those who depended on works were lost. But Anne crossed the line in 1637 when she denounced some ministers as preaching a gospel of good works. Critics accused her of antinomianism, that is, the idea that the elect don't have to obey God. It didn't help her case that a woman was teaching the Bible to men. Anne was called to give an account before the general court. She was anything but contrite. Sparks flew when she proved more adept at citing scripture than her judges. The die was cast when she said that her knowledge of the issue had come by revelation. The magistrates, already suspicious of her orthodoxy, seized on this to banish her from the colony. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. 